Which side are you on? 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 Are you on? Uh, yesterday, the LA Times had an editorial about this subject. It's about time. And they, and they said, yes, let's get the waste out of here. And then they named four possible alternatives. Uh, one is the uh, other uh, plant that Edison is part of ownership with it, Palo Verde. Palo Verde really said, we're not going to take California waste. Uh, another place in New Mexico, a uh, couple of rich people are at stand to make billions of dollars. And uh, it's a stand, we, we will find out whether the people in New Mexico will put up with that. Andrews, Texas, across the border from there, that's another possible place. A lot of opposition in Texas. Fourth place is, of course, Yucca Mountain, which is uh, the Republicans' favorite place to put it because they want to get payback to, to Harry Reid. Uh, even though the scientists have said that it would c contaminate deep underground water. They don't talk about too many other possibilities, but we, we're really st stuck with this because there is. Um, it's nice to say, let's get it out of here, but where's it going to go? That's the problem. So uh, the nuclear power industry has been telling us for years we can solve all its problems, and here we are, and we're not any closer to any solution. I don't know if you noticed, but in, in Florida, with a hurricane, the first place to close down were two of the nuclear power plants. They're very fragile, very unreliable, very dangerous. They know it. But and that's not what they tell you. Tell tell you it's safe, it's reliable, and and it's not. Uh, you probably heard that in South Carolina, they spent eight billion dollars building two new uh, uh, nuclear power plants, and they just abandoned the project. They said it's hopeless, can't, and they said it's way too expensive, can't be done. So they're they're closing those. So this is an industry in trouble. Thank goodness, but gradually there's a realization that one of the biggest problems, in addition to all the danger and everything else, is that there's no place to store, store the waste. So that's what we're here to talk about tonight. So tonight we have some, some uh, speakers who have been very active in this. Uh, first of all, we have Ray Lutz from Citizens Oversight, who recently was able to get some kind of a court victory, I suppose, because Edison agreed that they're gonna finally going to start maybe taking a serious look at moving the waste elsewhere. Um, so we'll see about that. Uh, thank you, Ray, for, for uh, holding Edison's feet to the fire. And uh, let's see whether they make any progress or not. And then Donna Gilmore is with us tonight. She has been adamant about this topic for many years. She's got a great website, sandinoforsafety.org. So if you want to know anything about the whole problem, go, go look there. She knows all about the, the casks and the, the transportation and the storage of nuclear waste, so she'll be telling us about that. We're not going to move it anywhere unless we have it in safe casks that are transportable. And, and, and those casks, uh, they want to keep them here for decades, and they're not going to last for decades. Now they're going to say it's too unsafe to move, and then we wait for an accident. Uh, as, as commentator tonight, we have uh, Gary Hedrick, is the head of San Clemente Green. Gary and his group was instrumental in having Edison shut down San Onofre a few years ago. So enough for me. Uh, Ray, I'm going to turn the microphone over to you. Great. Thank you, Roger. So we got a really long thing here, so I'm going to be oh. swiveling around. So Ray Lutz with Citizens Oversight. My background is as an engineer. I was trained as an engineer, electronic, electrical engineer. In about 2006, I started to become active in politics. And then we founded Citizens Oversight after trying to figure out how to be effective. And so I'd like to start off by talking about this just for a short time before I get into the specifics. How can you be effective to make change? How do you be a change agent in the world? Do you want to make change? Some people, maybe not. Change is difficult sometimes. Change will piss people off. Someone will get pissed off by a change. Okay, but change is important to make. Now, there's two things that we figured out, and these sound stupid, but they're really important. Number one, uh, work on stuff that you have a chance to change. Okay, um, number two, figure out what you might do to change that and then do that. 
everyone says, yeah, that sounds important, but I'll tell you, a lot of people work on stuff that there's no way it can never change. There's no way it can change. You gotta see, is there any way I can change that? Is there any strategy I can use to change that thing? And if there isn't, there are plenty of other things to change that are happening all the time, and that's what we encourage people to go to public meetings. Go to the city, the council meeting, maybe the fire board, water board, you know, hospital board. Sit in on. There's crap going on all the time. You don't have to have an agenda. You just find stuff going on and you say, stop right there. That's not the right thing to do. Instantly, it's gone. You've had a, a chance, instant power to change stuff. Well, I worked on Blackwater. We stopped Blackwater down in South San Diego. That was a year and a half project, and we got them out. Effective. Not because of me, the whole community worked on it. But we worked in a way such that we could get them out. Now, this plant, and we've got a real serious problem with the waste. This is a really hard problem, probably the most, you know, the hardest problem mankind has ever wrestled with. And how can we be effective at dealing with this waste? That's really what I was trying to, to help out with. Um, well, uh, as Gary knows and others, I was, after we did Occupy, I, I met with a, a woman that I was working with at the Peace Resource Center and I said, you know, the Occupy protests, they're not effective. They're not working. So uh, we said, let's, uh, <clears throat> the power plant just went down in the emergency. Let's see if we can help that out because it was a good, we can be, a, we can make a difference. We can change something there. So then we came up, helped out with a couple of rallies, and as Gary knows, we've been working ever since on this thing because it seems to last forever. This thing seems to last forever. Well, a big key meeting was the permit to put in the nuclear waste dump. I won't go into all the other stuff in terms of the $3.3 billion bailout mediation that I've been involved with, the, with Southern California Edison, that we're trying to now, Citizens Oversight is in the Ninth Circuit suing Southern California Edison for that. And we may be able to get some money back from the rate here. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that's that's pretty pretty tough going. Now, the other one is the decommissioning project, which isn't too controversial to have 4.4 billion dollars to spend on that. But the really hard one is this nuclear waste situation. 3.6 million pounds of high-level nuclear waste. So deadly that if you stand next to it a meter away, you'll die in three minutes. Not good. No. Now they put it inside containers, and their plan is to put it, as you know, 100 feet from the water on the beach, or next to the beach, and only inches over the water line. In fact, we've, we heard from a whistleblower that they actually have to pump the water down. When they started digging, the water was coming up, so they had to pump it down because it was gonna be <laughs> too hot. The, com uh, the community engagement panel you've heard about that's going to be meeting, uh, I guess, next week. Or this week? Day after tomorrow. Day yeah. after tomorrow. Edison, Edison uh, you know, fake meeting that they have set up. It's, well, they had this key permit up here uh, with the Coastal Commission. The Coastal Commission handles all of the coast of California. Five people. <clears throat> and the CEP never told us they were in process of approving the permit for the nuclear waste dump. Now, the Coastal Commission doesn't allow roses to be planted in the coastal zone, but they allow a nuclear waste dump? That's something wrong with this picture. Of course, they allowed the nuclear power plant to go in, so that was right there a problem, right? So uh, now, uh, we went to the meeting up in Long Beach after only finding out it at the last minute, and testifying there and saying we don't like this idea you only get two minutes but I had two people give me two more minutes each I got six minutes thank you imagine Arturo and how what can you do in six minutes not too much because they've already decided they've already met with the utility in bathroom meetings to decide that they're going to do this so it was it was approved and then I met with my friends Mike Aguirre and Mia Severson of Aguirre and Severson this is one of the top law firms in the area. If you don't know Mike Aguirre, he's a street fighter. He'll, you know, he's good. So this is the top law firm handling this for us. 
this, this negotiation with them in the settlement. You can't get better than that, basically. And so we sued them, and after legal wrestling for a year, finally the judge says, okay, we're going to let the case go forward, and then right before it was going to be decided by the judge, it could have gone either way. The judge could have said, no, they get to do it, or we're going to stop it. So uh, the decision was that we're going to go for settlement because then we can get something to happen versus maybe you know, striking out. And so, and, and that happened in April and April through August, and we have the settlement, which was announced August 28th. Now, we didn't have a very strong hand here because remember the Attorney General of California, at the time was Camilla Harris, came out and put a piece in, and it was carried forward by the new guy, Becerra, in favor of putting in the nuclear waste dump. So the Attorney General of the state is against us. This, the Sierra Club guy from up in north, he wrote a letter, he liked it. He wants the nuclear waste dump. Yeah. Glenn Pascal. Yeah, Glenn Pascal. Give him credit. He put a letter in. San Diego County said, no, we don't want it, but the guy who represents San Diego County on the commission voted for it. This, because he probably got something in the back room. Now, so we didn't have a strong hand to play. So either you settle, or if we didn't settle, let's say we chose, we're not gonna settle, we want everything. Then they would just go back, put the permit back in, and do it again. They would cross T's and dot I's and do it right, and then we had nothing, and then they would go ahead and it would be approved again. Guess what, they approved it the first time. There's not gonna be that much resistance from the Coastal Commission on the second round. So we didn't have a lot to work with. We couldn't file an injunction because we didn't have the money. We couldn't round up the $200 million. Something less someone in this room happened to have it. No, okay, so we didn't, couldn't go down that trail. No way to do the $200 million fee to make it stop. And no one could raise that for us, okay? Even the big real estate guys, he says, I can raise money for you. How much do you need, you know? I said, well, 200 million. He goes, okay, you can't raise that much. So we went through the settlement, and we got a settlement plan, which is based on having them try to move the waste out of there. Try. Now we know it has all these loopholes in the agreement. But that's what the attorneys do. They're paid by the other side. We know Southern California has an unlimited budget, 150 attorneys, and so the, the settlement is going to be something that they can weasel out of. Um, so it's not that strong on our side. But they have to try. They have to try. And nowhere in any other um, nuclear plant in the nation have they tried. Most five famous words of nuclear industry, we'll figure it out later. <laughs> they haven't figured it out. It's been 20 years since they were supposed to have a place. 1997, they were supposed to be picking this up. Now 2017, that's 20 years later. So we haven't seen anything happen, nothing. Yucca Mountain is, is not a solution. This fuel is way too hot. Even if they wanted to put it in, they'd have to cool it with fans for 200 years. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> So people are not thinking here. And the best thing that we can do is to get this information exposed to the public. The fact that we have all of this nuclear waste around the country. The fact that no one really wants to move it because it's so toxic. The fact that nothing has been planned. All the canisters are different <coughs> sizes. They won't do, they're not standardized. They've, they've got Those puppets and other real places. problems. Okay, can't do too many questions because I'm short yeah, on time. About five more minutes, mate. Yeah, so I have here the summary, which I'll test you on at the end. <laughs> okay, <laughs> the quiz. But basically, you can see they have to try to find a place. They're going to hire an expert team. They have to work out transportation, at least have a plan. Have a strategic plan of what to do. Where are we going to put it? Try. And they have a places they have to try. The Palo Verde nuclear plant. The places over in New Mexico that are supposedly opening up. And they have to do inspection and maintenance and repair plans for what they have here today. Now that isn't really our agenda. We're not trying to make it really work that well here, even though it's important. 
Our agenda is moving it, moving it. It's got to get moved. They have to make reports and implement the strategic plan if they can figure it out. They have to implement it if they can get the money. They're not going to do it without getting money. Guess what? These companies work for us because we're the rate payer and we pay them through our rates. They go to the Public Utilities Commission, get new rates, and our utility bill goes up, and then they do whatever they, they want. But that's good. I don't think the public doesn't want this to happen. If we can get an implementation plan and we can move the waste out of the coast, let's do it. That's not going to cost very much for each one of our bills. So this, this settlement, even though it's just a try, is monumental because it's the first one in the country ever to happen. We're the first. So we're celebrating. This little win on the 24th with their little flyer here down at Oceanside, the iconic Oceanside Amphitheater. So everybody should come. Here's what's important now. We have this little sprout of movement in this area toward moving it. And we need to continue the momentum. We need to make it real as possible. Everybody should be talking about, yeah, it's moving. Southern California said it, said it was going to move. What, they're not moving it? Oh, they lied to us. You know, we need to get on that kind of a mode and not be saying, oh, they're going to not do it. We can't, tr they, we know that it's not going to happen. No, I don't want to hear that. I want to hear that it is going to happen and I want to hold their feet to the fire if it doesn't happen. That's the mode we need to get us into. And move, get the motion of everybody working in that direction. Do I want to talk about what's happening with the details of what's going, not really, I want to talk about transportation, where it's going to go. That's what we want to be thinking about. It's your mind in the right place. Now, some people have said, what's, how come you're not working on the thick canister issue? These canisters are too thin, and we need thick canisters. I looked into that. There's no way I can see of changing the canisters. Can't do it. Not going to happen here. I don't see any way to do it. I, if anybody comes up with a way, I'm all ears. I can see no way to change these. Even if you hate them, it's not changing. Why? Because the NRC approves those. You've got to have a court case at the NRC. If anybody says, I don't like the casts, have you filed a case at the NRC? No? Well, then shut up. Because unless you want to do it, what are you talking about? Even if you did file the case. And they approve the thicker casts. Then you have to get SCE to adopt them. NRC has no power to do that. They've already adopted this. They've already spent millions of dollars to put this in. There's not going to change. And oh, maybe in the future, maybe after I'm dead, our young people, not too many people under 30 here, <laughs> 40, 50, Okay, some people are younger here, all right, but uh, at heart, all right, we're all young at heart. So we need, that's why we're trying to get that younger generation in, because they're going to have to take, take over for our ridiculous idea. Where are the surfers? Yeah, well, you need, to, you, need, uh, you need to have diversity of age in your group a little bit more here, folks. Um, now, we, are, we do have the surfer group that's coming to our event hopefully we do have Ian Cairns who supported us who is the top surfing pro in the world who's come a few times but that's the agenda now we want to do this this next thing is the celebration because we're winning now and we need to push this in the direction of moving it that's what we want to focus on positive positive direction what are we going to have to tackle all the laws red tape People that don't like it coming to their area, people that don't want to see it on trains moving it around. There's a lot to talk about, and you know what? Just talking about it is really important. Really important to deal with. The fact that this is here, we have to deal with it. We have to come up with a solution. And it can't stay here on the coast. Now, here is the phrase, no new dump, move the waste. No new dump, move the waste. Let's hear it. No new dump, move the waste. No new dump, move the waste. Okay, so 
stop. What's happening in the meantime? Is they still burying the stuff? I. Their okay, are be at the it end. is it, the pace of them is not in the settlement. We have no control over what they do. Yeah. We were going to get reports about what they're doing with it. My my opinion is they should not move it to the new cans right away. They should leave it in the spent fuel pools longer. But there was no way that was going into the settlement. And let me just say this before I give up the microphone. If you were an administrator at SCE and you had to make the decisions about this extremely toxic waste that there isn't anything worse than this, you couldn't do anything that was not the safest decision at the time. So they pretty much have to move it into these, this thing that they did build because they like to build stuff and then charge us for it and then take it out over and over. Power lines, set fuel things, they just love that. So they are probably going to at least start to use it because then they get to say it's used and useful and then they get to charge us for it. So guaranteed they're going to put some again for replacement. Guaranteed they're going to put some in there. And I kind of predict they're going to just put it all in as fast as they can. All right. But our agenda has to be because I can't we can't stop that is to just figure out how to get it to move out of there. That's the agenda that we have to work on. Okay, thank you. All right, great. Thank you. Lots of talent, please. And we're looking for solutions. So, Donna, you're welcome. It's not moving. It's in now. All right, thanks everybody for being here. Is this working? Yeah, you got to hold it close to your mouth. Close to my face? Okay. Yeah. I want to, I learned how to spell nuclear a few years ago. And, I was sitting in my backyard, loving this gorgeous weather, finally found my dream place to live, live in San Clemente. I was read in the newspaper, Gary Hendrick was quoted in the newspaper, and how I met Gary. Employees at San Onofre being fired for reporting safety problems. So I couldn't believe it. I thought it must be some disgruntled employees or something. I couldn't believe it. Uh, but I went to my first NRC meeting um, they admitted they have problems, met a whistleblower there, he showed me how to read the NRC website, I found an interesting table there and uh, turned it into a chart and it showed that Southern California Edison has the worst safety rate in the entire friggin country. This is a one year chart, this went on for eight years. The red line is San Onofre. And they have the highest rate of in the whole country. retaliation of employees who reported safety problems. We use this, uh, and that's how I met Gary, because of that article, and then we've been working on this ever since. I, I call, I call you and Ray and Gary my nuclear family here. <laughs> so you, you'll meet the best people fighting uh, on the side of it. You won't make a lot of money, but you'll meet the best people. Yeah. So, uh, so I uh, could not, so I, I never thought, I'm used to getting my way to work when I, when I was working. You know, I'd figure people tell me I couldn't do something and I'd always get it done anyway. Or I'd, I'd be cleaning up somebody else's messes, you know. And so, but I thought taking on a nuclear plant, I've been thinking in a million years we'd ever succeed. And, and we did. We had help from uh, Friends of the Earth. Uh, we had help from somebody in Laguna Beach that heard about what was going on and donated millions of dollars. Um, our friends of the earth actually stayed at my house, so I kind of got an insider view. What it actually took to shut this plant down. Edison, Edison spent almost a billion dollars replacing parts, changed the design, and, and it was a bad design. They didn't listen to their employees. Uh, they told them it wasn't going to work and it leaked radiation, we'll never know how much, <laughs> had decades of wear and uh, less than two years of use. And they wanted to restart one of those reactors. So, um, so Gary and I and others, we started going to cities and getting them to pass resolutions to not restart it. And what I learned is that uh, this chart, I don't care if you're Democrat, Republican, or anything, you see you're dealing with somebody with the worst record, and we had bipartisan support. And we had another chart 
uh, showing that we have a 40% surplus of energy without the nuclear plants. And they've been lying to the businesses that we're gonna have brownouts and blackouts if it shuts down. And people were arguing about what percent energy does Edison provide? I said, that's not the question of what percent they provide. How much do they need to provide? So the framing is, is, is important. So I don't have time to go into that whole battle, but unbelievably, you know, we won that battle together. You know, we all played different roles and together we made it happen. So that's very encouraging. So I said, well, you know, they screwed up, they screwed up running the plant. Before I do any remodeling on my house, what the heck are they doing without waste? What I learned they're doing is they're storing it in thin, little over half inch thick stainless steel canisters. And apparently Edison hasn't learned that you don't use stainless steel next to salt water. <laughs> and neither has the NRC. I listened into a Nuclear Regulatory Commission technical meeting and they said that they know that these canisters can prematurely crack, but they have no way to inspect for cracks once it's loaded with lethal fuel. And I couldn't believe what I was hearing. So I said, well, let me, let's just say you figure out a way to inspect for cracks, then what are you gonna do? And this is the director of spent fuel management, the top guy approving it. And he says, well, that's one of the challenges we have here at the NRC. <laughs> and he kind of laughed. This is, I thought the NRC was doing their job. I really did. I could not imagine anybody running a nuclear plant or regulating it is going to take any chances. I, my whole career has been working on mission critical systems 24-7, uh, big projects. And you know, you don't, you have backup, you have all kinds of things. And I'm finding the opposite is true. So I'm, you know, I'm in this, I'm a lifer at this point. And um, they have had canisters there since uh, 2003, so it's been 14 years. Some of those current canisters, there's 51, they've been there since 2003. Uh, the Coburg nuclear plant in South Africa had a comparable container. It was a, it was a tank. It wasn't a, uh, didn't have nuclear waste in it. It leaked in 17 years. 17 years. So that, if you do the math, if we have the same kind of luck, you're talking about three more years. And each canister, contains about as much highly lethal radioactive uh, cesium-137 as was released from the Chernobyl nuclear accident. So you've got basically Chernobyl in a can. Not a reactor in a can, but the <coughs> Chernobyl disaster in a can. Uh, and this is what we're faced with. So maybe some people don't think it's possible to solve this problem, but Mother Nature doesn't care what we think. Right. That cracking's going. Right. And what I learned, I met with the former chairman McFarland of the NRC. She did not know these canisters couldn't even couldn't be inspected, didn't know about the cracking. I I'm standing in line in the restroom behind her because she just got through saying they're safe. And I'm saying, well, you know they can't be inspected. What are you talking about? They can't be inspected. I said, well, you can't get close to them. I said the thick ones that everybody else uses in the world, you can get close to them. And she goes, Oh, that's right. They, they, they have to be in those big concrete over. We don't have anything that could inspect them. I mean, this is what we're dealing with here. Uh, and then I spoke to John Kotick. Oh, she was on Obama's uh, Blue Ribbon Commission for what to do with the waste. And I spoke to John Kotick. He was on Obama's commission. He didn't know about the canisters. I spoke with uh, one of the chief deputies at the DOE who's responsible for all the waste. And he was a nuclear engineer on a submarine. And at first he didn't believe me, but I have the evidence that he believes me. So he gave me my cell phone and we've been talking a lot. And he's ch they're changing priorities of this item now. What could that's going to do? They don't talk. Anyway, so what I found is that people at the highest levels, and I met with a, one of the current chairmen, uh, one of the current NRC commissioners. I went back to Maryland. He didn't know anything about this either. So. The people, the people with power and influence do not know about this problem. So we need to be able to get to the right people, get the word out, you know, I don't care if it's John Oliver or what, but we have a hard time getting the information out of the media, but we need, we need more people to help because there's very few of us to get the word out, uh, uh, get, get um, cities on board, have them talk to their elected officials. There's a bill right now, HR 3053, Shimkus bill that's in the House 
might come up for a vote, a vote this month. Um, and this bill is supposed to be helping us get the waste out of here. But what the people that even are voting for this in a subcommittee, what they don't know is the bill does some extra things they aren't mentioning. It eliminates the current legal requirements for storage and safety storage and transport of nuclear waste. There are some good laws on the books. It eliminates the requirements for safe storage and transport. It eliminates a site evaluation. And it, it, it also preempts state and federal water rights, state and federal air rights and other rights. It is a terrible bill. Um, it also it, it allows the Department of Energy to make private contracts with private companies and, and allows them to do everything with no transparency, no oversight, and no input. The people voting for this bill don't know it. Lisa Bartlett spoke at the last CEP encouraging this bill. She didn't know anything about it. We met with uh, Camilla Harris's staff. They didn't know anything about it. So if we can't get to our elected officials, there's not enough of us to do this. So we need more people. And we have some handouts. We have some talking points. So we need people. I have a sign-up sheet to get more involved. You know, we got these ticking time bomb Chernobyl cans that, are, that aren't going to wait for a new location. And I can tell you right now, the people in New Mexico and Texas, I know these people, they are going to fight tooth and nail not to have this. And in good conscience, we need to fix this problem before we give it to anybody else. There's 2,400 of these canisters across the country right now. The, the United States has standardized on inferior technology because it was cheaper. And they, knew, they know better. But this has been kind of held as a secret. All kinds of people didn't know about these issues. The rest of the world uses thick, our, ours are this thick. The rest of the world, they're, they're 10 inch to almost 20 inch, 19 and 3 quarter inch thick. Okay. They can be, yes, the walls. Yeah. Picture of them. Yeah. You can inspect inside and out. They're maintainable, repairable. Um, you know, they're, they're, and nothing's going to last forever, but it's sure going to buy us, you know, 100 plus years. And, in, and they keep them in buildings for environmental and security protection. Um, so, um, cities do not feel comfortable advocating for thick cast, but, you know, the way that I present it is, and I did this with, with ISIS staff, I said, uh, well, actually I've done this with a number of people, I said, I, I, I asked somebody, uh, now, you're not an auto mechanic, but you feel qualified that if you're going to buy a car, that you're only going to buy a car that you can inspect? repair, maintain, and get some warning before something major goes wrong. I mean, everybody in here wouldn't buy a car that didn't meet those basic requirements. Well, guess what Edison bought? They bought can canisters that don't meet any of those requirements. This is common sense. This is poor engineering. You don't have to be a nuclear engineer, electrical engineer, or any kind of engineer to know basic design safety requirements. So. We've got, we've got the nuclear industry running roughshod over our gun government, and, and we're going to have to step up because nobody, nobody else is. I'm working with groups nationally and even internationally on this. I'm getting the activists across the country educated on this because they've been advocating for these canisters, not even knowing what they're adding, advocating for. The Union of Concerned Scientists, the, the, I know the Democratic Party at least, they respect them, and they do a lot of good work, they wrote a letter to the Coastal Commission, to the Energy Commission, endorsing dumping this waste right at the beach. This is crazy. Yeah, he didn't know what he was talking about. I talked to him after and kind of educated him on some things where he had some wrong assumptions. But um, anyway, so it's, it's been a, a struggle. Uh, so I, I think, you know, we, we, we need to basically be the leadership to show them how it's done. And if we can't in Southern California with the people we have that live here, the power, the influence, the money, if we can't do it here, who can? So I encourage you, I got a sign-up sheet to sign up, keep informed, get more involved, you know, just you know, contact me. 
and uh, let's 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 save our let's save Southern California so we all don't have to evacuate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's amazing what individual people can do. Just just a few individuals can just think what a lot of people could do. Uh, I love the name Citizens Oversight. Isn't that great? Yeah. yeah. We're going to oversight what, what the government does, what they do. So, you know, let's do it. So, Gary, you got some solutions for us. <laughs> yeah, we're going to run this. Wow. <laughs> that was very, uh, very impressive and uh, humbling to be oh, Gary, preceded by would you do me a favor? Speakers. I forgot one thing. The, the, the flyer people have, we need to write to the co to, we need to write to the Coastal Commission to, so they know we still don't want it on the beach. Okay. Right, right. Okay. Um, but I'm humbled to even be here speaking in this company in our nuclear family. We all type bonds from this experience working together. But um, to have a systems analysis analyzing the situation the way Donna has has been remarkable. Electrical engineer and uh, activist, bulldog, you know, Ray's been just right there all the time making things happen ever since I met him. And I have uh, a different background. I, basically, I'm an artist. I do architectural renderings for architects so they can show people what they're going to build before they build it. So I took a lot of pride in my career because I'm just trying to help people see what's really being proposed. And I kind of feel like that's the same role I've been playing here because I'm not the expert. You know, I'm not the architect, I'm not the designer, I'm not telling people how to do things. I'm just giving them a realistic picture of what is being proposed and should we approve it or not. And that's pretty much my comfort zone. But you can't be comfortable in that without experts advising you on what you should be proposing or what you should be presenting to the rest of the public so that they get a fair shot at understanding the situation. And unfortunately, my experience has been confirmed over and over again that Edison is not to be trusted, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is not to be trusted, and we're in this on our own. So we've got to realize that some of the assumptions we might have made about our comfort level with uh, trusting the experts when it's such a complicated issue as nuclear waste especially, a problem that's never really been solved yet. And we have to band together. There's uh, just, you know, yesterday was the anniversary of the 9-11 attacks and it's such a, you know, you think about the unity we felt after the attacks throughout the world, instant, you know, we were together. And that's because the tragedy happened, you know. We watched Florida fighting against the forces of nature and they could anticipate, they could see it coming. And they banded together and they helped each other get out of harm's way. And all kinds of wonderful stories of humanity and coming together in the face of this adversity. But I think that's what's missing here. And, what happened in the San Onofre shutdown episode was we were facing a choice of restarting a nuclear reactor that was damaged and they didn't even want to fix it first. They were going to experimentally restart this reactor, you know? People can get behind that. They can get their heads into, that does not make sense. We're not going to allow that to happen. So I was really pleased what Ray's efforts produced. Uh, one of them is to get uh, experts in certain areas of this problem to resolve, really look at it factually. And unfortunately, you know, this Edison's calling the shots. He mentioned they have loopholes. Nothing is uh, committed as far as any advice this panel gives to Edison. They can take it or leave it. But um, in the process of them saying, well, we're going to get these experts on metallurgy and we're going to get people on canisters and we're going to understand the questions that the public has uh, brought to our attention, they're basically admitting that they don't have answers. If something happened at San Onofre right now, and they had a leaky canister, there's nothing they can do about it. They've already eliminated the fire department that had special training in nuclear issues. 
they've left, left us hanging. They're, if there's an emergency, we have to rely on our local emergency response people to basically tell us there's radiation, don't go near, you gotta get out of here. But they can't handle this stuff. We really need to put pressure on the industry nationwide. You know, it's actually a worldwide problem. But we're not going to do it until we have that mentality of we're in a crisis, we need to stick together. Everyone's got different pressure points. Ray's got pressure points, Donna's got pressure points. We need more people to submit their ideas and we need the support for uh, our own independent experts. You know, people that trusted, we trusted during the nuclear, um, I mean the shutdown song. They're still available. They want to go to work for us. They can't do it for free. Maybe there's some ways that we'll get that, but uh, you know, in my mind as a visual person, I just think I'd love to see a documentary where they can forecast what's going to happen in this invisible plume of radiation that's going to threaten everybody. How is that going to change our world? How many billions of dollars more is it going to be than a uh, hurricane or something like that. We're never going to recover from it if, if this nuclear radiation gets out. There's only one cure is to prevent it. And there's only one way the industry is going to listen to us. Is we've got to get mad as hell, attend workshops, attend meetings, be there to write letters. Um, there's opportunities in, the, in Donna's handout, actions we can take coming up as soon as Thursday at the CEP meeting. Can you... I think we call it the community enragement panel because they never listen to us. <laughs> but, um, you know, there's the Coastal Commission is still coming up. I mean, Ray's efforts were originally to negotiate to re revoke the permit so that they would never put those uh, silos filled with radiation that close to the ocean. You know, that didn't work out. But that doesn't mean we can't keep fighting for that kind of stuff. There's uh, endless opportunities to get involved and if we don't we have no one else to blame but ourselves and you know I, I'm sorry for what the future generations might think of us if we make a you know if we turn the other way leave it someone else to do um, anyway it's really uh, just intimidating amount of responsibility and I feel <laughs> unqualified to be making decisions about what's right, what's wrong, but I'll do everything I can to get factual information out there so we can all make good decisions and support whatever's going to solve this problem as soon as possible. So I hope you'll get to ask a lot of questions. Thanks for your time. I'm glad you're here. Um, Mary Beth, would you like to say a word? Where can, they, where can anybody see this? Go to the YouTube and just go to Eon 3. What I'd like to add to all of this is that we, we're doing a, a documentary on this amazing um, rallying to, to this cause uh, by people in this area, this wonderful nuclear family. What we're focusing on is the effect, the amazing power of, of people, just ordinary people, to step up to the plate and deal with these incredible challenges. We believe that um, people's movements have made incredible changes in our life in all kinds of ways and in uh, our country and in the world. So please, please consider getting involved. We need you right now and um, you can make a huge difference, not only right now, but for generations to come. You know, at the last uh, CEP meeting that we attended, somebody at Ray's press conference said, wait a minute, what, what is the matter with radioactivity? What does it do? How many people know what radioactivity does to your DNA and to your biosphere? Okay, we need a lot of education on this. This has been dropped. Um, and, and it's been, the, the um, messaging has been very effective by the nuclear industry to paper over 
what the problems are. This causes problems on in every system, in every biological system of all biological creatures, not just humans. And this will this this DNA damage can promulgate throughout generations. One of our heroes was Rosalie Bertel, a wonderful Canadian nun who was a biostatistician. And she proved with her, she, she was actually employed by the Atomic Energy Commission and then um, went on to do much brilliant work. And what she showed was that by the fifth generation, fertility would be so effective that procreation would be very rare. This is what we're facing on, on an international, national, and California level. So please consider getting involved. And thank you so much for organizing this, Roger. We know that radiation is not good for your cells. Um, think of Florida. Did you watch the television? If you can imagine all that rain coming, imagine it's a plume of radiation. And it's not going to go, it's going to stay, keep coming. I tried to run away from radiation. And I said, well, we're going to evacuate. Well, look how they tried to evacuate in Florida. Can you imagine evacuating around here? You can't run away from, uh, from, uh, from gamma particles. Uh, okay, let, let's, um, Dr. English, do you, do you, you've been doing this for a long time. Do you, do you have a couple words of wisdom? Yeah, just a couple. We know any more now than we did 50 years ago? <laughs> I think the mistake we made is we focused on the long-term thing. You know, you got to keep this thing safe for a number of 100,000 years or something like that. And we got everybody thinking about that. The mistake we made was we forgot about the risk this afternoon. Exactly. You know, how dangerous is this stuff this afternoon? And I think that that's where we lost the public. Because, you know, 100,000 years is not on my, uh, my, my line, right? So it's, it's well beyond us. But this afternoon is big. Like, if you were to have some sort of accident with one of these, what you call them, Chernobyl bombs, right. you know? Um, if, if an airplane dropped out of the sky and hit one of those things, now, you know, those big, those big uh, containment vessels that are out there, those are designed to withstand something like a 727. That's an ancient airplane. Uh, it could hit one of those things, and it would, it would be a little problem for the reactor, but it's not going to basically spread stuff all over the place. If you hit one of these uh, waste disposal sites, these uh, interim sites 100 feet from the ocean, what would happen there is, uh, uh, what would it take? A pipe or cub? You know, uh, how big a plane would it take in order to spread that stuff all over the place? And once you do it, the thing you've got to worry about is that, suppose that happens tomorrow, uh, an airplane hits that stuff that's already there, okay? What we have to do is we have to abandon a 50 mile radius around the plant, essentially indefinitely. Now, uh, I, I live in Carlsbad, which some of you know is very, very far away. My house is 35 miles away, so I would have to go, okay? Uh, what would that do to the economy? You could use five anyway, so five would be shut down indefinitely. You'd probably have 15 also shut down. So what you do is you basically ruin the economy in an afternoon of this area. And that's not going to recover within our lifetimes. So that economy goes down to twos. The thing that happens is this area has a, what, 8.5 million people? So what that means is that uh, that's, a, uh, that's a big slug of California's economy. That means California's economy goes down the tubes, okay? California's economy is the sixth largest economy on the planet, okay? If California's economy goes down, the U.S. economy goes down, okay? So what happens is the worldwide economy goes down all because of some stupid little airplane flying into this stuff, you know, where we should have surfers. So this is the kind of stuff I think we somehow need to get this message out that this is not 
just a long, 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 long term problem. This is something that could happen this afternoon. And then we have to do something about it to wake up our politicians, let them know that if they do not care to address these issues, we will be happy to remove them from their current responsibilities. Thank you very much. The Sandia National Labs did a study that found that a medium-sized truck bomb outside the perimeter could cause catastrophic damage. Uh, think if you're in North Korea, what would be a good place to send one missile? Never mind if it's nuclear, just a conventional weapon. And one, uh, 130 Chernobyl canisters we have? Get anywhere in there. Donnie, you had another? And then we got to have some questions. Right, right, yes. I, I looked off one thing. I have this handout. Um, they, there are some new coastal commissioners uh, at the Coastal Commission, and when they heard some people um, locally went to a, a Coastal Commission meeting, and they heard what the co commissioners had done, and it was like, you did what? And so they have asked the, the Coastal Commission staff to have a meeting, and that's going to be October 11th in the morning at Chula Vista. And so it's an opportunity, even if they don't listen, to get the word out, to spread the word, to get some press, to get that out, and really tell those commissioners what you want and what you need, so to start that ball rolling. And if you have any influence or connections with the people that appointed those commissioners, uh, it would be useful to be able to talk to them. Thank you. And there's some information on the handout and more on the website. Which side are you on? Which side?